Amen. A round of applause. Today is the day that life begins. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it because He is risen. He is risen indeed. Yes. Let's give a round of applause for everything you've seen this morning, for all that Jesus has done, for this amazing musicians that's here today, and the fact that we get to be here today and we get to be in this spot, in this time, in this moment, because I believe that this moment right now, as we've been preparing for this moment for months, we're preparing for this spot right here, and I believe that even though I've been preparing for this for months, that God has been preparing this moment since the beginning of time, since before the foundation of the world, He knew that you would be here right now, sitting in the chair that you're sitting in right now, hearing these words of mine to say that today is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So today, today is a good day, my friends. Today is a good day and I'm so happy to be here and I'm so happy that you guys are here and it's so good to see all of you. And so since we're, we're in a spot where there's other people that's never been here before and, and you don't know me and I don't know you, I said, what can I do this morning that's going to bring us all together? And what I believe is common to all human beings everywhere is that we have been wired to love a good story. We've been wanting to love a good story. This is why we love movies. This is why I'm going to the Mario Brothers tomorrow after school because I haven't seen it yet and I'm ready to go see the new Mario Brothers movie. It's why? Because we love a good movie. It's why I've been watching every Avengers second for like 13 years and I don't miss it and I'll watch it again because we love a good story. The thing that unites us together is that we love a good story. And so today, as we're here on Easter Sunday together in this spot to celebrate what God has done, I want to tell you guys about three stories today. Three stories, and all three stories have the same theme. It's a story about a father and his kid. A father and his kid. And so as we talk about Easter and we think about Easter, if you really think about it, if you boil it down and you look at it, the very elementary level, Easter is actually a celebration of a father and his kid. You know, a lot of times we think that Easter is about the bunnies, and about pastel colors, and uh, about egg hunts, and, and you know, for some of us, we think Easter is about Reese's eggs, right? Because there is nothing better than a Reese's on Easter. Even, you know, it's like Jesus and Reese's, and it even kind of sounds alike too, right? Like, this is amazing that we have this here, and so on Easter Sunday morning, we have all of our Reese's eggs, and we got to make sure this is what, I, I love it, and I love Easter, and I love the excitement of it, and I love the festivities, but if we allow that to be the focus, then we've missed it. Because Easter is not actually about the bunnies, and the eggs, and the pastel colors, or even the Reese's. It's actually, it's actually all about Jesus. It's a story of a father and his kid. And the first story that we're going to look at today, if you're taking notes and you got one of the bulletins you come in today, I like to keep it simple. I like to give you three words to write down every week. Sometimes I'm ambitious and I give you four, but this week we're going with three. And if you're taking notes, the first story I want to tell you about a father and his kid is a story of love. You got notes, that's the first blank that you're going to fill in today. It's a story of love. And the way that we know that Easter is a story about a father and a kid and that it's a story of love is because of the most famous verse in the entire Bible. John chapter 3, verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Which is why I believe that Easter is actually a story of a father and his kid. You see, the reason that we celebrate today, the reason that we get so excited about today, is because there's another verse in the Bible that says that he who knew no sin became sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So here's what this really means. What this really means is that we as human beings, we've been created for a purpose, and the purpose that we've been created for is to have a relationship with our Creator. You see, a, a toaster, its purpose is to toast. A blender's purpose is to blend, and, and they know it, and they've figured it out. A toaster never says, I want to be a blender, and a blender never says, I want to be a toaster, and knows its purpose, and it fulfills its purpose as best it can. But us as human beings, we always like to question the Creator, don't we? And our job as human beings, our purpose for being here is to have a relationship with God. The problem, the dilemma, 
The issue comes in the fact that God is a perfect God. And we've done this thing called sin. Now, if you walk in the door today and you think, oh my gosh, he's talking about sin and he's going to point to me. Now, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to point to me because I'm going to let you know that I'm a sinner. I'm going to let you know the Bible says that we all are sinners. And because of this sin, we now have a huge chasm between us and our creator, us and God, us and our very purpose for existence, which is why God sent his son, Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he took all of the sin of the world on his shoulders. And at one point, the only time in recorded history and the only time it will ever happen in recorded history, God the Father turned his back on God the Son. Because in that moment when he was hanging on the cross and Jesus was carrying all of our sin and all of your sin and all the sin of past, present, and future, at that point, God couldn't even look upon Jesus because of that sin. But when he was on the cross... He said the words that we talked about on Good Friday. He said, it is finished. It's paid in full. And that's why on Good Friday, we commemorate the day that he died for our sins. And on Easter Sunday, we celebrate the fact that he rose again. We celebrate the fact that God the Father and God the Son united again. And now you and I can have a relationship with God. Now you and I can fulfill our purpose of having a relationship with our Creator because of what Jesus has done for us. That's why I believe Easter is a story about a father and his kid. And that's the story of love. But sometimes what we do when we think about Jesus is we think about Jesus based on the celebrations, based on the holidays. You know, like there's, there's this Christmas Easter group, right? It's like we talk about Jesus on Christmas when he was born and on Easter when he rose again. And in these two holidays, we celebrate Jesus and we like Jesus and we love Jesus and we honor Jesus and that's all great. But in between the first Christmas and the first Easter, there's a whole lot of stuff written in that Bible. And one of the things that I love about Jesus is that he knew that one of the things that was going to unite all of us is that we all love a good story. And so Jesus would tell stories in the Bible that would relate to us. And sometimes they would be about something all the way out here in left field. But when you get to the end of the story, you're like, oh, I get it. He was talking about me. And one of those stories we're going to look at today is a story that he gave. And the story, I believe that the story, at the very core of it, is a story, again, about a father and his kid. And the story, if you're taking notes, this is our second story we're going to look at today. And the second story we're going to look at today is a story of mercy. So if you're taking notes, this is your second point. Your first point was a story of love, and your second point is a story of mercy. And in this story that Jesus tells, he tells a story, and we've labeled it, we've titled it, we've, we've, we've said that the story is called the story of the prodigal son. So maybe you've heard of this story, but if not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you know a little bit about how this works. There was this, this kid, and he went to his dad, and he said, Dad, I want my inheritance. I want my inheritance, and I want it now. Now, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what kind of family you live in, but I don't know any family where that's going to that's gonna be good, right? I don't know any family where this is going to go well. First of all, even if I had an inheritance to give you, kid, which, by the way, my kids, you know what they're going to inherit? A 25 years of student loan debt at this point, right? That's what they're going to inherit. But for the rest of everybody else that actually have an inheritance, could you imagine going to your parents and saying, hey, listen, I, I, know, I know things are tough right now, but you know what? I'm kind of done with this house. I'm ready to go out on my own. I, I want to I find myself. I want to figure out who I am. Maybe backpack Europe, you know, whatever it is. But I need, I need my inheritance now so that I can do that. You know, basically, what the prodigal son would have been saying to his dad back then, I, pretty similar to what he would be saying now, he's essentially saying, Dad, you're dead to me. But the only way you get an inheritance is after somebody dies. And if he says, I want the inheritance now, he's essentially saying, you're dead to me, and I don't need anything else except for the money that you have. Now, here's the thing about this story. As we hear this, the very first thing I'm always thinking is, why did the dad agree to this? 
right? Like, why didn't the dad just say, uh, no, right? Let's, uh, this is a pretty simple question. No, we're not going to do that. But because this is a great story, he went ahead and did this. You know what I was thinking about? My Uncle Oscar, uh, my Aunt Joanne's back in the room. My Uncle Oscar, he used to tease my grandmother. You remember this? He used to tease my grandmother. And every time she would go and buy something, she'd go buy like a microwave or something small, maybe even like a cheeseburger. He would come and he'd be like, why are you doing that? You're wasting my inheritance right now. He would tease her all the time. And so I, I don't think it was quite that joking in the sense that the prodigal son was talking. I think he was being vicious when he was telling his dad that I want the money. And for some reason, the dad agreed. And so now this guy's got all this money. And, and he goes out on his own. And you know, when he's got all this money, you know what else he also has? It's a lot of friends. And he has all this money. You know what else he also has? A lot of parties. You know what else? A lot of opportunities. The problem is, he didn't invest this money. He didn't get any sort of side gig. There was no side hustle. This money was finite. And at some point, the money ran out. And when the money ran out, the friends ran out. And when the money ran out, the parties ran out. And when the money ran out, the opportunities ran out until the prodigal son, who had all the things in the world that he wanted, was left with no money, no food, no place to stay, nothing. At this point, he decides, the best thing I can do is I can go and I can start working at this guy's pig pen. I you think about this. Like, like of all the things he could have done, this is what he decided. I'm going to go and clean up for this pig. Now, that's bad for us, right? Like if somebody today, if like Jacob up here in the band, he was like, you know what? I'm done playing in the band. I'm done with my dad's garage. I'm going to go work in the pig pen, right? I'm going to go clean up the slop. We're going to be like, bro, what are you thinking? Like that's what you want to do? Like it would be bad for us now, but back then... Remember, pigs were unclean animals. I think the thing that I had the hardest time about with all the Jewish people in the Old Testament is they couldn't eat bacon. I'm like, what? How do you, how do you even live without bacon? But at this point, he couldn't be around unclean animals, and he's cleaning up after them. He's washing them. He's watching them eat. He's feeding them. This was the worst thing that he possibly could have done. And at some point, he comes to this realization. The realization is, hey, my dad's pretty well off, and he's got servants, and I bet you his servants or even doing better than I'm doing. So to finish this story, I'd like to read directly from the scripture to make sure I don't get any of these words wrong. And this is found in Luke chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 17. So if you have your Bibles, you can pull it out. And if not, you can just listen. I'll try to read slow. Here's what he says. When he came to his senses, this being the prodigal son, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robes and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now is found. So they began to celebrate. How about that for a story of a father and his kid? The story of the prodigal son. Do you start thinking about this? You can just picture the prodigal son as he's there in the pig pen thinking, oh my gosh, everybody's got it better. I'm going to go take the long walk home. And he starts to rehearse. You guys that might have been in this situation. If you're married, I know you've been in this situation where you're trying to rehearse your apology, right? And he's rehearsing it. He says, uh, I have sinned against heaven and against God. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. No, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I don't know. Look, we're caught. I don't know if that's right. I, I, I've done this before, right? I know you guys have. You married people? You know it. Come on. Let's just... Let's just call it what it is. Men, you know we've done this before, right? You know we've done this before. Like, oh my gosh, I've made, I made my wife mad. I'm going to rehearse this. Oh, okay, I got this. Wife, I've sinned against heaven and against you. 
I can't believe what I did, and I told you to calm down. <laughs> I have sinned against heaven and against earth. I'm no longer worthy because your husband allowed me to be your servant. Or you're at work, and it's like, a, oh, all right, boss, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I've tried to, <laughs> tried to microwave a pita, and I almost burnt the office down. I'm no longer worthy because your employee allowed me to be your... Or, or you get pulled over, you get this, right, they come up, and then you're rehearsing. It takes forever for that cop to get your window, by the way. You ever notice? I don't know what they're doing, but I think they're making you wait on purpose so you can rehearse your apology in your head, and they get up, oh, officer, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm sorry I was going 90 and a 35. Allow me, allow me to be your servant. I'm no longer worthy to be a citizen of the United States. Hey, we've done this. We've, we've rehearsed these thoughts in our heads. We've done this apology so we can put ourselves in the prodigal son's spot. But in my mind, every time I've thought about this story, I'm just going to level with you and be honest. Every time I've thought about this story, I, I, I picture stuff. I don't know if you guys are the same way, but, but I always picture it like a movie every time I read something in the Bible. And every time I picture the story of the prodigal son, if I'm being honest with you, I've always pictured like a little house on the prairie or like a the Waltons kind of deal. You guys know what I mean? Like, like they're always sitting on the front porch like whittling. Right? I don't know what they have left to whittle, but they're always out there with a pocket knife and a piece of wood just sitting on the rocking chair. And I always picture like Paul was just sitting there waiting for the son to come back. And like, you know, they have like this long driveway because they got like 40 acres and then at the end of this a white picket fence and then he's sitting there in the rocking chair just knowing that the old John boy is going to come back and so he's waiting there and there he is comes in the picket fence and he gets up in his overalls and he goes and he runs to them the problem is that's not at all the way it actually happened I don't know why I pictured that through the years but that's not the way it happened because understand this story took place in the Middle East and in the Middle East this just isn't the way things were set up the way things were set up is that you lived in a village. In this village, you were really close and tight to everybody. Like you knew everybody and everybody knew you. You had to be a part of a village in order to survive. If you didn't, then they had this whole pillaging thing that was happening, right? You're not going to make it out on your own. So you lived in this village. You had a huge wall up and you made sure that you made nice with everybody in the village because you don't want to live outside of the village. But there was this thing that would happen. There's this thing I want to enlighten you on this morning. There was this thing that would happen back in the villages, back in those days in the Middle East, and it was called Keza. Keza. And what would happen with Keza is that there would be leaders of the village, the, the, the top people, the top dogs of the village. And they were the ones in charge of deciding if people were allowed to be in their village or not. And when Keza would happen, Somebody would come back to the front gate, somebody that had done something wrong, and they would have to face the judgment of the leaders of this village. Now, there are two main things that you could do wrong to be kicked out of your village. The very first one is you marry somebody outside of your village. Now, I get this, right? Like, I can understand, like, if my daughter came to me when she's 51 and she's allowed to marry, we do have a binding contract, by the way. She signed it. She's not allowed to get married until she's 50, but then she made me mad one day, so now it's 51. But when she's 51 and she's allowed to get married, what if she brings me this boy and he's like an Eagles fan or something? What? <laughs> or like even worse. So here's, here's, here's my new boyfriend. He's from New Orleans. He's a Saints fan. Oh, uh -uh! over my dead body. I would say he might be a Falcons fan, but you know those don't exist. right? But, but for the rest, everybody else... Right? I could imagine they come up and, and she tries to do this. No, no, that's not going to happen. And so at that time, if you're the leader of the village and you came in and you say, hey, here's my, my new wife. She's from that village. Now the leaders of the village, they would have to decide whether or not that was acceptable or not. The other way that you would face this judgment is if you took some money that belonged to the people in the village that should be circulating within the village people, YMCA, within the village people, and you took it and you kept it in there and you used it outside of the village specifically on the Gentiles. And you gave your money and you squandered your money to the Gentiles, buddy, you're going to face judgment when you come back to that village. And you face judgment when you come back to that village. They had this word called keza. And what would happen with Keza is that the leader of the village would stand in front of you. And if he thought, if he deemed that you were not worthy to be in this village anymore, he would take a clay pot and break it at your feet. And he would say the way that this clay pot has broken into all the pieces is the same way that your relationship with this village is now broken. You are no longer allowed to be a part of this village. You must leave immediately. This was the judgment 
that they had to face. Now, the thing about Keza is moms were not allowed to be at Keza. They thought they might get too emotional. I don't know why. I don't agree with that. But the only way that you could be overlooked by Keza is if your father showed up. And if your father showed up and he decided that he wanted to show you mercy. So thinking about all of that, I want you to repicture the story of the prodigal son. I want you to picture that, that the dad is sitting there, not on his front porch, whittling in a rocking chair, but maybe he's in a town square where everything's real tight and everybody knows each other. And somebody comes up to him and says, bro, I, I hate to tell you, but I saw your son. He's walking home and he's walking slow. And he smells like a pig, just to let you know. And he's really dirty. And he's just like rocking back and forth. <laughs> I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be your son. Allow me to be your servant. Imagine the dad as he's thinking about this. He says, oh my gosh, I've got to do something. And immediately, the dad gets up and he runs. You've got to understand, back then, men were not supposed to run. In my opinion, now men are not supposed to run. But at any rate, definitely back then, men were not supposed to run. It was looked down upon. It was frowned upon. This was not what you do. And yet the dad said, I have to get there before the judgment comes. I have to beat my son to Keza. I have to make sure that I'm there before the clay pot is thrown on the ground. I have to go there because I have to escort my son past this judgment because that is my son. I thought he was dead, but now he's alive. I thought he was lost, but now he's found. i got to go find my son. And this is what the father was doing. And as he got out there, he went past Keza. He went past the judgment. He went past these leaders. He went past the clay pot. He went past all of the people that were looking down upon his son. He walked right past them. And the son says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Shh. Quick. Get my boy my robe. Quick. Quick. Get my boy a cell phone. Quick. <laughs> Get my boy a ring to put on his finger and a sandal to put on his feet. Quick. Go and kill the fattened calf. Because today we celebrate. And he puts his arm around his son and walks him right past the village gate. He says, uh-uh. You ain't touching my son. He's with me. I choose to show him mercy. This is the story that Jesus told in the Bible. This is the story of mercy. And I love the fact that when he told this story, he said to go and prepare the fattened calf because the only reason you have a fattened calf is because at some point, you're waiting for a celebration and you're waiting for it to come soon. You don't have a skinny calf just waiting there and then the party comes or we got to fatten that guy if we're going to have a party. No, you have a fattened calf because you're expecting what's about to happen. And that dad was expecting, my son's going to come back. Yeah, he made mistakes. Yeah, he messed up. Yeah, he said you're dead to me. But, but you, you know what? That's my son. And I love him. And I want to show him mercy. And I can't wait for him to come back. Which brings us to our third and final story. As Jacob comes out to make me sound more spiritual as I talk. Third and final story. It's his first story. The story of Jesus and his dad is a story of love. The second story is a story of mercy. The final story I want to tell you is a story of grace. And again, like the first two stories, the theme is a father and his kid. But the difference in this third story is that you're the kid. I'm the kid. You're the kid. The difference in this third story, the third story is the fact that you guys got up this morning and got dressed and came to 1700 East Bloomingdale Avenue to sit right here in these very uncomfortable chairs to sit here and listen to what you know God has to tell you today. If you came here this morning expecting to walk in those doors and face judgment, if you thought that this morning that church was going to be a lot like Keza, 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry for any time that a church has hurt you. I'm sorry for any time that you haven't felt loved by the children of God. But I want you to know, what I want you to know is I tell you this third story is that you're the main character of this story. And what we want, what we believe is that this is not a perfect church. And the people that go here are not perfect people. And I am not a perfect pastor. But the one thing, the one thing that I can tell you that we stand firmly on is that when you walk in those doors every Sunday morning, you're going to feel love and mercy and grace and not judgment. The third story is your story. And maybe you came in here today and you said it's Easter. It's time to talk to God again. I haven't really seen him since Christmas. About time to talk to him again. And, and maybe you came in this morning rehearsing your speech. I'm so far away from God. I got it. I'm going to pray. I know he's going to ask me to pray at some point silently to myself. And so I'm ready. God, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son or your daughter. Allow me just to be your servant. And I want you to know that this morning, if you came rehearsing your apology speech to God, he's telling you this. Shh. In the second you're trying to walk slowly to God, just know that he is running to you. That he is running to you. That he's running to find you because you are his kid. Because you are his kid. And if you are lost, you are now found. And if you are dead in him, you are now alive in Christ because of what Jesus did on the cross. You can sit here today and say, I was dead, but now I'm alive. I was lost, but now I'm found. And he's going to say, all right then, get the fattened cap. Let's celebrate. <laughs> you came here today. And you expected that we were going to throw a clay pot at your feet. We don't have any clay pots. If you're expecting for the leaders of this church to be waiting at the door for you, to tell you what kind of judgment we wanted to put on your life, we're not those people. But I can tell you, beyond the shadow of a doubt is that I am not worthy. I am not worthy to be a son of God. I am not worthy to be a child the Most High King. And yet God sent His Son Jesus to die on a cross for me. And the only thing that motivates us here at Extraordinary Church is that we want everybody in the world to know that Jesus died on that cross for you too. And that God loved you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. And if you accept him into your heart, then you are also a child of the Most High King. So as I start to land the plane here, we fast every Sunday morning as I prepare my message. I like to end by asking this question. It's not a very big question. It's not super theological. It doesn't have, it's only two words. So what? So what? I just told you everything I just told you. I just told you three stories. A story of a father and his kid. A story of Jesus and his dad. A story of a prodigal son and his dad. A story of you and your heavenly father. So what? What does this have to do with me? Why are we even here? Why is Easter such a big deal? Why are, why are you so fired up right now? Why, why, who, who cares? And the answer to that question is found in the book of Hebrews. Chapter 9. Verse 27, it says, it is appointed to man once to die, and then the judgment. Why is this such a big deal? Well, because it's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. 
You see, I, I like to make jokes, and, and everybody does, about what heaven's going to be like, right? They make jokes that we're going to get up to the pearly gates, and Peter's going to be waiting there with a bag of Chick-fil-A, and it's Sunday, right? Like, there's nothing better than that. And yet, if you look at the story of the prodigal son, what if heaven's not actually that way? What if what actually happens is that when you get to those pearly gates, you're actually at the wall to the village of heaven? And what if, if Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment, what happens if the, t the moment and the second that you die that you actually face Keza? What if you're standing at the wall to the village of heaven and they say, why should I let you in? And what I want you to know is that the reason that we celebrate Easter is because Jesus died on the cross so that you can know the answer to that question. And the answer to that question, if you get up and you face the judgment of heaven because it is appointed unto man's wants to die, and then the judgment, you say, because I know Jesus. And it's gonna, the word's going to get back to God. And he's going to come running. And he's going to find you and he's going to say, oh, you're here. Get my robe. Get the ring. Get the sandals. Somebody killed a fattened calf. My kid is here. And what if you get to heaven, God just puts his arm around you and walks you right past the judgment, right past Keza, and he walks you right into heaven. And he says, uh-uh, this one's with me. That's my son. That's my daughter. They once were lost, but now they're found. What I believe happens this morning is that since we all love a good story, what I know about you that we have in common is that we all have a story. And the big so what of this morning, the big who cares of this morning, is that I want your story to intersect with God's story. I want you to know that at your life, from the very first breath until your very last breath, that your story is a story of a father and his kid. And you are the kid. And he loves you, and he loves you, and he loves you, and he loves you. And that's why this is such a big deal. Because we serve a God who loves his kids. And he says they were lost, but now they're found. They were dead, but now they're alive. This time, what I like is we can just get to this moment that a lot of you guys knew was coming. <laughs> it's time we just kind of bow our head and close our eyes. And, and I just want you to be alone with God for a minute. And if you're rehearsing your speech, if you're saying, God, I've sinned against heaven and against you, just, just know that he loves you. So this morning, as we're talking about your story, I've decided that there might be three different kinds of people that hear the message that I have this morning and respond in these three particular ways. Maybe, maybe this morning you came on Easter Sunday morning and you're the prodigal son. You say, I've run away from God, and even though God gave me everything that I have, I've squandered it all. And today I want to come back to God. Another way that we like to say it is that you want to recommit your life to Him. If that's you today, I want you to hang on to that thought. I'm going to come back to you. And maybe today you walked in this room, and you were dealing with some hurt, and you have a whole lot of baggage that you're carrying. Maybe the hurt that you came in with is that there's been somebody, some church, some church member, some church leader throughout the years, some church structure that has hurt your heart. Or maybe you came in this morning and you're dealing with the loss of a loved one. You're dealing with a relationship that's broken. Or you have your own prodigal son in your life and you've been waiting for them to come home. And so you came in this morning with a lot of hurt on your heart and a lot of baggage in your backpack, I, I want you to hold on to that as well. I'm going to come back to you. There's a third person in this room. Maybe a third person in this room, you say, you know what, this morning when I came here today, I didn't know what to expect. I think everybody's pretty nice. It's pretty cool. The music was, was, was on point, but, but I don't know about this relationship with God. Maybe today you would say, I don't have a relationship with God. So I want to start with you. 
Say this morning, I don't have a relationship with God. I've never accepted Jesus into my heart. If I went to heaven today, I don't know if they would let me in. What I want you to do right now, if that's you, I just want you to put your hand up real high so I can see it. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to say what your name is. I'm not going to say where you're sitting. You say this morning, I, I don't know. I don't know beyond the shadow of a doubt that I have a relationship with Jesus. I don't know that I would go to heaven when I die. Just go ahead and raise your hand so I can see it. If that is you this morning, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to pray this prayer into your heart. Say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. And I know that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. And I accept him as my savior, to be my Lord. To know that one day I can go to heaven and that you'll walk me right past judgment. If that's you today, just keep praying. And I just want you to know that we're going to be up here at the front in just a minute. And we'd love to hear that from you. And maybe today you're in the other two categories. You say, I'm hurting. or I'm far from God. I want to offer up one more prayer for you. Dear God, thank you for these amazing people. Thank you, God, for all the people that got dressed up and came here this morning to be here at Extraordinary Church. God, what we know here is that we were created by an extraordinary God, and that's you, Lord. So I pray, God, that right now these people that are here, that are hurting, that brought in a lot of baggage, that, are, that maybe they're far from God, whatever it is that they have this morning, I pray, God, that they will not leave with it, but, God, that you will remove that from them, that you will remove any hurt that they have, that you, you will remove any broken hearts that's in this room. I pray, God, that this morning that you will, you will bring a time of healing and a time of comfort to the people that's here. Dear God, we love you so very much. And now, Lord, we just want to worship you, God. It's your name we pray. Amen.